Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Uh, we're uh, happy to have you with us online this morning, and uh, we trust wherever you are that you will join with us as we sing praises to our God. And uh, we are going to begin this morning by continuing with, I Come to the Cross.
please turn with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 15, and we will read from verses 1 through 7. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. May the Lord bless the reading of his word. Father in heaven, we thank you for your grace and mercy that we can be here in your presence. We acknowledge our brokenness and joyfully embrace the redemption that we have through the blood shed on Calvary. As your sheep, may we faithfully follow your voice. Fill us with your love to reach out to those around us with the good news of Jesus. Be with our pastors and their families as they travel. May their time away be a blessing to them. We lift before you those in our congregation who have needs, that you would be their strength. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. This parable of the lost sheep is one of the more well-known parables of Jesus. Luke chapter 15 contains three parables with a similar message. Each of them concerned the recovery of something or someone that went astray and the joy that accompanied their return. These parables of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the prodigal son were given after Jesus had been condemned for spending time with sinful people. These three stories were given to rebuke the religious leaders for their indifference to those who did not know the love of God, as well as to provide instruction for the Christian church as our duty toward the lost. The chapter opens with a jarring contrast between Jesus and the religious leaders of his day. Please read with me uh, verses 1 and 2. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. We are told that sinners drew near to Jesus and that he received them. The fact that the Pharisees referred to this group of people as sinners most likely meant that they were irreligious Jews. The verb that Luke uses to express that Jesus receives sinners implies to accept cordially, affectionately, or even to hold close to oneself. It is very interesting to notice that Jesus' life exhibited a form of holiness that attracted to him the morally broken, in stark contrast to the form of righteousness that the Pharisees and scribes followed, which which repelled those who knew that they were falling short. This causes me to ask the question, why would there be a class of Jewish people immersed in religious culture with their very identity as the chosen people of God who rejected the religious teaching embedded in their society and choose rather to be social and religious outcasts? I can't help but think that the shepherds of the day are partly to blame for this. They were not leading these poor folks to God as their savior, to placing their faith in a personal being who was the answer to all of their life's questions. They were not being offered spiritual guidance nor treated with the understanding that they needed. They were being taught that strict adherence to a moral code was what God was looking for and that anyone who was not able to please God by fulfilling the 613 commandments in the Torah was rejected by him. In the 11th chapter of Luke, verse 42, Jesus addressed these shepherds in this way. But woe to you, Pharisees, for you tithe mint and rue and every herb and neglect justice and the love of God. Their religion was a skeleton of rules and regulations. They entirely overlooked the important revelation of the Lord in the fullness of who he is, 
the God of justice and of love. And thus it is with every religion that misses or represent, misrepresents the gospel. It becomes a to-do list of fulfilling requirements in order to make ourselves acceptable to the Lord. We see this not only inside Christianity, outside of Christianity, but also unfortunately within it as well. Those who were treated with contempt by the religious leaders, who had never heard about a loving God who was seeking their own good, were attracted to Jesus. Here was a man who treated them as if they had value and who was not afraid to be polluted by their words and actions. In Luke 4, Jesus proclaimed regarding himself, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Sinners knew they were safe from hypo hypocritical scrutiny, from prejudice, from being treated as less than nothing in his presence. Jesus stood against the religious hierarchy who sought only to deprive them of hope and truth. He pointed them to God. They saw, him, they saw in him the hope of redemption. The story of Zacchaeus in Luke chapter 19 is a prime example of this. Here was a chief tax collector, a man who was disdained by all, not only the Jewish, not only the Jewish leaders. When Jesus announced that he was visiting his house, there again was general disapproval. He has gone to, in to be the guest of a man who is a sinner, they said. We would do well to ask ourselves how others see us. Are we truly holy or just religious people who follow a Christian standard? If we have been regenerated by the Holy Spirit, there should be something about us that will be open to the fallen and seeking to reach the lost. The love of God should flow through us to each lost sinner that we meet. In story form, Jesus asked the Pharisees a question. Verse four, what man of you having a hundred sheep if he has lost one of them, does not leave the 99 in the open country and go after the one that is lost until he finds it. Every first century Judean would have been familiar with sheep. Many of his hearers probably owned sheep. They were an important part of the economic, culinary, and religious life of every Jew. For example, during the exodus from Egypt, the children of Israel were instructed to select a lamb on the 10th day of the first Jewish month as a Passover offering. They were to keep it with them for a few days until it was sacrificed on the 14th day of the month. This lamb was then prepared and eaten by the family. Whether that custom was continued in Jesus' time, I am certain, but it illustrates the close connection that they had with this animal. We have a small farm with, very, with various kinds of life, livestock and understand the care that is necessary for these creatures. When we hear coyotes yipping at night, our thoughts go to the well-being of our animals. We know the concern for an animal that goes missing and the joy and relief of finding a lost one. I'm sure many of you can relate to the anguish of a lost pet and the feelings that are experienced with its return. The flock of sheep represents humanity, as Isaiah aptly says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. If we examine the particular characteristics of sheep, we can see a reflection of ourselves. Sheep are one of the more unaware and seemingly less intelligent of the herd animals. I once saw a short video of a man who rescued a sheep from a crevice and only seconds later it jumped back into the same crevice. Sheep cannot help themselves. If a sheep falls on its side, it cannot get up. Alone in the desert, it is vulnerable to heat, to exhaustion, and to dehydration. No creature is more defenseless than a sheep. A goat has cunning, speed, and climbing ability as defense mechanisms to either outwit or outrun dogs and other predators. Sheep lack these skills. It is said that a sheep can be so fearful that they will lie down despondent if they are in a dangerous situation. They will just wait for death to overtake them. The lost sheep in the parable represents not merely a witless animal that has haplessly gone astray. Rather, it is a member of the flock that has turned a deaf ear to the voice of the shepherd. 
It has heedlessly sought out its own path, intending to follow the dictates of its own heart, and has fallen into a state from which it cannot redeem itself. Each of us starts life as a rebellious sheep, following the dictates of our imagination in a course that is in opposition to God. We have no natural defense against the world, the flesh, and the devil. Without the redemption offered to us through the blood of Jesus, we are captive to the will of Satan. He seeks our destruction, and we are naturally complicit in following him to the pit of perdition. Satan is a ruthless lion, always on the prowl, and we, like sheep, are no match for his deception and his malevolent intentions. Jesus continues, And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found that which was lost. Notice the text does not say if, but when he found the lost sheep. A shepherd was the owner of the sheep. The sheep were his livelihood. They were a source of wealth and nutrition for him and his family in a society that literally lived from meal to meal. Sometimes several families would graze their flocks together. The one tending the sheep could not be lazy or complacent. If more than one flock was being tended together, the owner of a lost sheep may only own two or three. If one went missing, the shepherd would not say, Well, I have 99 sheep here. I shall not concern myself with the one sheep. This one sheep may have represented a large percentage of the wealth of a particular sheep owner. Reading from John chapter 10, Jesus compares the shepherd, who is the owner of the sheep, to a hired hand. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd, who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, I lay my life down for the sheep. Jesus says that the sheep are his possession. The lost sheep in Luke's parable, is the person who has not yet learned to hear and obey the voice of the good shepherd. The shepherd seeks out this lost sheep. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are one of the sheep that hear and follow his voice. You are under the care of a tender shepherd, and though you may at times wander, he will keep you in his fold. These are the joys of being part of Christ's church. As the psalmist says, he makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. If you are not yet a follower of Jesus, then you are a lost sheep. And this word is his call to you to turn and to follow him. The good shepherd is seeking for you. He offers you forgiveness of sins, a new life in him, and an eternity to spend with him. Jesus has promised that all who come to him, he will never cast out. He says in John 6, For this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks on the Son and believes in him should have eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Expressing the magnitude of his love for the lost sheep, Jesus continues in Luke 15, Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. The love of God toward lost sheep is demonstrated at every possible step. First, in cordially receiving sinners. Secondly, in earnestly seeking the lost. And thirdly, in the immense ecstasy that follows their recovery from darkness and ruin, a joy that rings throughout heaven. And so, as we follow our master, we recognize a call in this parable. 
There are principles that we ask the, need to ask the Lord to apply to our lives. First, we must learn to value others the way Jesus values them. We need to receive those who do not know Christ and eat with them. Observe the way that Jesus treated the lost and the way they were attracted to him. He regularly took time out of his day to meet with them where they were. If we are upholding Christian virtues and separating ourselves from the world with the goal of proving that we are better than they are, we will be ineffective at sharing the gospel. The true follower of Jesus recognizes that they are a brand plucked from the burning. They have no inherent virtue or value any, any different than the greatest sinner. We should see and say, but for the grace of God, there go I. It is true we must be sure to be faithful to the Lord and not to compromise in our example. The lost are looking for something that they don't have. If the church bans on biblical principles, adopting the ways of the world in order to try to win souls, it will not produce the right effect. The purity of intention of our Lord must have been a big reason why people were drawn to him. In our present system, people expect to be taken advantage of. In the case of Jesus and his followers, there isn't a carrot at the end of the stick. We have experienced the love of the Lord. We know firsthand what it is like to be lost and without hope. We should have a genuine and burning desire for others to know Jesus as we know him, to have the assurance of salvation, to trust in a beneficent creator and sufficient redeemer who has our lives in his hands and our eternal life secured. We have the comfort of knowing that whatever we face in this world, we are not alone. We have an anchor in a rough sea, something that those who do not know Christ cannot experience. Secondly, the church is the hands and feet of Jesus. We have been drawn by grace to a gracious God. We need to realize that, through, that though salvation is free, there is a cost to discipleship. Reaching the loss for Christ is part of bearing our cross and following him. Jesus has given us to us the task of reaching this world with the message of the gospel. This is something we are feeble at. I freely admit this. I have been in situations where I have either been blind to my responsibility or just plain afraid to share the good news and be ridiculed. Like you, I struggle with this and, and for being rejected for believing in a God I cannot see and trusting a Savior who I cannot give visible evidence. We forget that the job of convincing is for the Holy Spirit. Our task is to spread the seed of the good news it isn't for us to force the seed to sprout and to bear, bear fruit. If we could come to terms with that and trust that the Lord will effectually bring those he has called to repentance, we would not be so petrified to bear witness of what Jesus has done for each one of us. Thirdly, we should be sharing in the heavenly joy of watching people being set free to know and worship the one who made them and lived and died for them. There is great rejoicing for every sinner who repents. Pharisaic religion has ni neither love for the lost nor the incl inclination to speak redemptive truth to them and subsequently experience no joy in seeing them come to repentance and faith. Are we proud religious people? out of touch with the heart of God. The Father sent all that he had, his only Son, to this world to save sinners like you and I. Jesus came to his own, but his own did not receive him. He experienced ridicule, mistreatment, and death to obtain eternal salvation for his people. This is the revelation of the extent of the love of God. God is by nature a savior. He is described as such in both Testaments. This sets him apart from all other ent entities, all other powers. He came to earth and took the name Jesus, which means Savior. Jesus is the good news. The God who made us is for us and with us and loves us so much that he died to save us. He has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but has delight in the repentance of one sinner he seeks out and save, saves the lost sheep. And as his followers, 
Let us open our eyes to our hurting world to reach out with a message of hope. Lord in heaven, as we go from here today, we have great gratitude in our hearts, Lord, for your seeking and your saving of, of, of us here, Lord, of your people, Lord, and we ask that you would impart to us that, that sense of urgency uh, for the lost, Lord, that we see in this parable that this was a, a compulsion that the lost sheep must be saved, and Lord, that we know we can only do this in, in your strength and, and with your leading, and for that we pray. Be with each of us in the coming week, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen.